Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever you are in the world today. My name is Radha Kothari, and I'm joining in from Mumbai, India. From all of us at Intellicamp, Intellicamp, I would like to extend a very, very warm welcome to all of you that are joining us for the 14th edition of the Sankal Global Summit. We are proud to be one of the world's top global convenings at the intersection of business and development. We are delighted that you've joined us today alongside other entrepreneurs, investors, global foundations, development leaders, corporations, donors, and other ecosystem players from across the world. Over the next three days, you will experience a virtual summit unlike any other. Our agenda has been designed keeping in mind the entrepreneurs and anchored around knowledge, capital, and networks. In the next three days, we offer a range of insightful sessions, workshops designed to learn, and enterprise showcases to highlight investment opportunities. I would now like to invite Vikas Bali, the CEO of IntelliCap, to welcome you to Sankalp. Vikas, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Shraddha. I hope I'm audible. Uh, very, very warm welcome to all of you participating in the 14th Sankalp Global Summit. This summit is a celebration of impact entrepreneurship focused on progressing the social development goals 2030. Intellicap's purpose of creating this platform is to accelerate the pace of change towards achievement of these goals. We hope to deliver on this promise by facilitating conversations amongst various set of stakeholders, government, developmental financial institutions, philanthropic foundations, investors of all hues, large corporates, and of course, the impact entrepreneurs who are driving the change on the ground. The conversations at Sankalp are focused on identifying the challenges that block us, developing solutions, and co-opting the ecosystem participants who would help us in creating and delivering impact at scale. These solutions must be deliberated in the context of the overall global macroeconomic environment the headwinds to which are many. I briefly highlight five areas in no particular order that we will hear of often in the discourse over the next few months in the pursuit of achieving better harmony amongst people, planet, and profits. The first one being deglobalization and breakdown of the supply chains that we have assiduously built over the last few decades. If the pandemic was not enough, we now have a war that could potentially increase the mindset towards more self-reliance being the more prudent approach for many critical items, including even agricultural produce. This posts the question, how do we leverage the benefits of collaboration across the global South against the headwinds of localization that may be on the rise? The second big headwind, the big will become bigger. The impact on MSMEs of the continuous wave of shocks is unabating. They do not have pricing power. The ability to sustain losses, the ability to keep their workforces going till there is a full return to normalcy. Inflation running riot globally affects them most with the cost of materials rising very, very significantly for most of them. Further, Financial institutions are becoming more averse to lend to more riskier business models. This begs the question, how will the governments find the right balance between supporting the MSMEs, who are the bulwark of employment generation, versus the more headline-grabbing billions of investments made by a few large transnationals? The third headwind, or dare I say the perfect storm, climate change no business will be left untouched. I repeat, no business will be left untouched as all of us will be impacted individually. The events just this year are a clear indication that there is no tomorrow. The scorching heat in Europe, the floods in South Asia, and many more such events. Businesses could potentially see their addressable markets shrink with increased vulnerabilities of their customers. Businesses have to invest substantial capital to make their supply chains net zero, while addressing many unknown unknowns about their markets. 
The question to ponder is, how will big business continue to generate value for its shareholders while becoming more valuable for the people and planet? The next big headwind, the era of low cost capital since the 2008 meltdown may be coming to a pause. The need for capital will be more pronounced for achieving the global goals, but the cost of capital is going to be at its highest since the last few decades. IntelliCap's work with thousands of impact enterprises suggests that there is a gap in the mid to high single digits between the commercial debt market rates and those affordable by impact enterprises. The question is, how will we square the circle? Find the capital to flow into ideas that will not appear as lucrative in the short to medium term, and certainly not on metrics that we are being used to being evaluated. The last headwind, also an opportunity on mass customization. In this information age, businesses have the opportunity to develop products and services for the micro markets. You could offer a product on one side of the road and a different version of it to suit the needs of the customers and consumers on the other side of the road. This requires a fundamental shift in mindset. Do we have it in us to move away from a sales to a solution mindset? That is, instead of selling standardized products and services, to develop solutions which address the needs of the consumers. To throw light on these and other issues, we have assembled an extremely distinguished panel to open the three-day summit. They bring the best of government, large private sector, and developmental financial worldview. I'm sure you will find their wisdom enlightening and inspiring all of you to drive change in your spheres of control and influence. Before I hand over the stage to them, I would like to share with all of you IntelliCap's learnings accumulated over the past two decades in addressing the developmental challenges. The first, capital, knowledge, networks, and technology all need to come together to address the developmental challenges. Just as the underserved person, health is not enough, food is not enough, nutrition is not enough, financial inclusion is not enough, so also for all entrepreneurs who are trying to address the needs of the developmental challenges, capital, knowledge, networks, and technology all need to come together. Second, a concerted effort needs to be put by the developmental institutions to search, seed, support, and scale impact enterprises over a time frame of at least four to five years to drive sustainable change. Number three, new financial structures such as blended finance and instruments need to be developed to get capital flowing to impact enterprises on reasonable terms in the short to medium term. Number four, large private sector needs to look at impact enterprises as their own extended innovation arms in their journey to remodel their businesses for a green economy. And last but not the least, our mindsets need to change to resilience. It is a unique word, friends, combining two thoughts, adversity and opportunity. Resilience has to be built at four levels, at the individual level, within organizations, within extended supply chains of organizations, and last but not the least, at the ecosystem level as well. It is this mindset that will be crucial to nurture fresh ideas to pave way for a better future. Friends, the journey towards a better tomorrow starts with the acceptance that many of the formulae used in the past may, long, may no longer serve us. Sankalp is a platform to discuss all these new ideas and pave the way for a better tomorrow. On behalf of IntelliCap, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you participants and my heartfelt thanks and gratitude to this exceptional panel and those that will follow. Thank you and back to you, Shraddha. Thank you so much, Vikas. So to get us started today, the plenary session explores transforming impact across the global south. Please join us for this engaging and insightful conversation with Wendy Werner, Sandeep Chakravarti, and Zaved Akhtar. 
Wendy is the India Country Head for IFC. Sandeep is the Joint Secretary at India's Ministry of External Affairs. Zaved is the CEO and Managing Director for Unilever Bangladesh. This session will be moderated by Shireen Khan. Shireen is the Managing Editor for CNBC TV18. I'll now hand it over to Shireen to get us started. Shraddha, thanks so much. And uh, what a pleasure it is to join you here at the Sankalp Forum. Uh, you know, we were doing a call yesterday to just take stock of uh, the issues that we wanted to touch upon today. And it took me back to my very first interview with Vineet, uh, uh, who founded Avishkar on my show Young Turks, which goes back almost 20 years now. Uh, and it's uh, it's been a privilege to be part of the 14 years that Sankalp has been around. I'm so glad that we've been part of this conversation uh, and we've been able to uh, nurture this collaboration. And I hope that this ecosystem uh, develops and strengthens further. Uh, you know, uh, thanks very much, uh, because setting the context for where we uh, stand in the world today, there are several headwinds, but I also believe that this is an area of opportunity uh, for impact investors as well as impact entrepreneurs to try and find solutions uh, to address some of these very large uh, problems, these very large challenges, and of course, uh, solutions will be required at scale. So let's get started uh, exactly uh, where Vikas uh, left things. And I want to get uh, Wendy to kick this conversation off. Wendy, as Vikas put it, there are several headwinds at this point in time, whether it is deglobalization, the inflation crisis, the energy crisis, the food crisis, uh, uh, there is a war, uh, and we don't know how that is going to impact things in the medium to the long term. Uh, given this, how much of a setback do you believe uh, we are likely to see on the development goals. Uh, it looks very clear now that the 2030 targets that had been set are unlikely to be met. Uh, of course, as far as uh, developing economies are concerned and low-income economies are concerned, particularly uh, vulnerable uh, you know, uh, in terms of the debt that they carry at this point in time, the cost of capital moving up. So 2030 out of reach at this point in time, how concerned would you be about the environment today? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Shireen, and, and thank you to Sankalp for having me again this year. Um, so I think, Shireen, you ask a, a critical question. Obviously, there are headwinds, but India is particularly a, a, a point of light, let's say, in, in, this, uh, in this kind of stormy uh, external environment. Um, you know, we see that growth continues to be quite um, strong, and we can see that there's quite a few um, excellent examples that uh, have the potential to grow, um, both in even mobilizing domestic capital um, for these purposes, for the purposes of impact, um, as well as, um, you know, maybe the international capital markets are a little bit more challenging. Um, uh, clearly, it's going to be an effort that that requires uh, multiple parties, as, as Vikas highlighted, in order to achieve uh, the sustainable, uh, sustainable development goals and all of our goals. I think every one of our development institutions has you know set quite ambitious goals but put in the context of india we see that um i think that the everyone is moving in the same direction the government's um uh, priorities on policy um, from whether it be logistics or um, uh, as well as like infrastructure um, and inclusion are all very much uh, in place and trying to in make sure that the uh, that any the green transition the energy transition fully includes um, small and medium sized enterprises. So I think that's one of the um, kind of uh, situations that we have that we feel there is significant potential. But we do need to accelerate uh, what we do. And um, our managing director was just here in India for a full you know, five days. And he um, you know, committed to the government as well as our clients that we would be doubling what we do here in India. So I think that it's just a good example that um, those who uh, have the mandate to be doing both you know, development and uh, investment, uh, we, have a, we have a very clear uh, road ahead. Um, we need to accelerate what we do. So it's not a situation where we need to have huge amounts of change. We can do a lot with what the tools we have at hand. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's a good note to start on. And you're right in pointing out that in uh, India finds itself poised relatively better in comparison to large parts of the world uh, at this point in 
of course, were completely decoupled or immune to the global, global turbulence and the global volatility that will impact us uh, as well. But let me get Sandeep into the conversation. Uh, Sandeep, thanks very much for joining us. As Wendy was pointing out, uh, you know, the path has been set and big areas of focus continue to be on financial inclusion. Of course, uh, uh, there are changes expected in agriculture where innovative solutions are being looked at. Uh, climate and the climate crisis is a big challenge, a worry, but also an opportunity. And the green transition uh, has been impacted on account of the current global energy crisis, but India is hoping that we move forward on the renewable targets that we have set out for ourselves. In terms of partnership, in terms of doubling down on actions already taken and investments already committed, what is uh, the view of the government and should we now realistically done? Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you, Shirin, and uh, thanks IntelliCap. It's a privilege to be part of uh, this panel. Uh, I would just take on from what, what Wendy said, and I think uh, it's a very interesting endorsement of uh, government policy. And uh, I think uh, India is, a, is, a, is really a bright spot of uh, stability uh, in this global turbulence. And I think uh, in the past, when uh, people used to harp a lot on the fundamentals of the economy being strong, I think Today, we understand what it means, you know, that uh, a strong, a large economy, a strong economy with uh, with relatively low inflation, I think, uh, is standing by us. And, uh, you know, it's not um, subject to such shocks as, as we have seen in other parts of the country, including uh, in South Asia, in, in, in at least in, in Sri Lanka. So, but I think it's difficult times for everybody. There is no denying of the fact we came out of one major disruption, which was COVID. And then there is this conflict in Europe. So I think uh, these are not very good times for the world economy. And there have been geopolitical changes in the world. We have witnessed uh, uh, geopolitical changes and you know how the world is aligning up. I think these, these have impact on global economy. Uh, but I, I agree with what uh, Shireen said in the sense that uh, some of these uh, agenda items of the government, the policy priorities of inclusion, uh, financial inclusion, digital, digitalization of the Indian economy, uh, green transition, uh, and, and uh, you know, creating um, infrastructure, creating roads, electricity infrastructure. These have been the policies for the last uh, several years. And I think these are standing us in good stead. And uh, particularly, I would say that digital uh, inclusion and uh, the, the jam trinity, the jandhan uh, and mobile and, and, uh, and the bank accounts, I think this have been uh, very very useful in covid 800 million people got food uh, from the huge reserves we always wondered why fci is piling up such reserves but i think they came very handy when uh, when covid struck us so i think uh, we are going strong on the policy front the challenge in india has always been implementation i think if we improve our implementation if if uh, uh, we can really deliver to the last uh, uh, last mile i think uh, then i think we are in in for major transformation of india I am really concerned about whether we, the world and India can meet our SDG goals. I think that uh, midterm evaluation needs to be done because it has been disrupted by, by COVID and by, by the conflict in Europe. But uh, I'm sure that uh, for the world to succeed in SDGs, India has to succeed. There is, there, is, there is just no other option left. And I think that realization is very deep down uh, in, in the government system uh, to which I, I belong. I will uh, uh, finish by mentioning that uh, you know the partnerships that we have India with with uh, with uh, developed countries is very strong, and I think in every converse I deal with Europe, so I will I will mention only Europe. Uh, every conversation that we have with our partners, whether it is the EU or the UK or France or Germany, uh, the focus is on on SDGs. The focus is on uh, energy transition. Uh, we we are uh, in discussion on on energy transition with all our European partners. We have energy transition partnerships with them, and I think the ambitious goal that uh, the Prime Minister of India has set for India of uh, at the at the COP26. I think we are we are all set to achieve that, and I think uh, my sense is that we may achieve it even before 2030. And uh, the new uh, NDCs that we have uh, listed with the uh, with the UNFCC, I think we are all set to, to achieve those goals. And I will end by saying that, you know, as my prime minister says, we, we are doing this not because the West or the world is asking us to do it. We have to do this for our own good. We cannot afford to, to be to be gray or black. We have to go green. The jobs have to come from the green uh, sector. We have to become more environment friendly because it is for our own good. 
Uh, yes, we absolutely have to go green. It is in our own self-interest to do so, as you point out. Uh, uh, and it's interesting uh, that you believe that we should be able to achieve the the targets that we've set out for ourselves, at least uh, as far as the uh, climate commitments are concerned, ahead of 2030 uh, in terms of the medium-term goals. But on the SDGs, I think it's very clear, and I've just come away from uh, the annual Gates Foundation Goalkeepers uh, event, which is a report card of sorts of uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. And it looks very clear at this point in time, uh, given the impact of the pandemic and now the impact of what's happening across Europe with the war uh, and, of course, uh, the inflation crisis and the rise of interest rates that uh, that we are very far behind on being able to meet the goals that we had set for ourselves as far as the SDGs are concerned. But let me welcome Zaved into the conversation. Zaved, Akhtar, the CEO and Managing Director of Unilever Bangladesh. Zaved, thanks very much for joining us here uh, on this conversation. And I think, uh, you know, as Vikas was pointing out, uh, companies like Unilever uh, have not just believed in addressing the profit question, but also in addressing the purpose question. And as you look at the world today and how it's playing itself out, uh, what can companies, private companies like yours do in order to further the cause of purpose? And how are you evaluating or re-evaluating purpose in this very challenging and volatile environment? Thank you, Shireen. Thank you for the question and thank you for the opportunity to come here today. Uh, in fact, uh, if you, as you said, the context and talk about headwinds, and I think all of us would believe that we are in a perfect storm. This reminds me of Nassim Talib's book, Anti-Fragile, where you actually have disorder, but that's an opportunity to see what we can gain out of it. And I think this current moment, actually, look, you, we all need to look at opportunity. I think this gives the confidence of business being a force for good. And that's what I think is core. And we need more of that to come in uh, because that is what's going to make a huge amount of difference. And let me give you a bit of perspective as well, because I think Bangladesh is a classic example of having headwinds. 50 years back, I don't think any of us would have stood and said that Bangladesh should be where it is today. And when I see what is happening to the globe, whether it is the climate vulnerability, whether it is the economic degradation, whether it is about all the other headwinds on health and uh, uh, environment, We've seen it all, but despite all this thing that goes against, it is the resilience of the uh, prudent fiscal policy, great work done by development organization, and even the private sector participation. Had that not happened, the country wouldn't come to where it is today. And even today, yesterday evening, I was with uh, some of the industry leaders as well and discussing about the country risk and opportunities. And I think there's no doubt there are a lot of headwinds there's a lot of dependence, but obviously there are new ways of working where business really needs to now step up and start contributing to the direction. Because you're right, the SDG goals, we might get delayed, but I think the direction of travel doesn't change. We need to be committed to it. We need to travel because I think the idea is that we need to achieve. If it's not 2030, it would be 2035, but it doesn't mean that we change our direction, we change our goals. We go ahead, there will always be headwinds. For instance, uh, one of the things that Vikas talked about, um, deglobalization. The way I refer to it is a redefinition of globalization, because today's world, it will be a country to country, region to region uh, collaboration. And we believe that's where we'll see a lot of things foster. And if you can really work around those, please, and make sure private enterprises are also part of it because uh, and, and really starts creating impact, that's when we see. because And that has to be the core of, to the strategy of private organization. It can't be relegated to the periphery. And that's why I believe organizations like Unilever will thrive, will have headwinds, but we must stay focused on making sure that with profit, we also focus on purpose because we cannot operate without isolation. You know, and that's an important point that you make, Zaved. Uh, you know, in the context of everyone talking about deglobalization, it takes me back to a conversation I very recently had with the global CEO of HSBC. And he said he views it as re-globalization, emphasizing the point that you just made as well, that since people are now looking at resilient supply chains, it's not going to be cutting off from the world, but it's going to be rewiring or reorienting existing relationships, developing new relationships. And so we are going to see a reshape of global supply Absolutely. chains, not necessarily a cutting away of uh, the global links. But Wendy, let me come back to you because, you know, uh, cost of finance, access to capital, uh, this is going to be the big challenge. This is also going to be the big, uh, important area of focus. Uh, now, what we have seen, as Vikas was already pointing out, is a uh, 
interest rate trajectory that is only going to move higher. We've got 50 plus central banks across the world at this point in time, hiking interest rates. Uh, India uh, is also on the cusp of announcing further rate hikes, which is expected at the end of this week. So in terms of access to capital, cost of capital, uh, as well as blended finance and something that uh, we we touched upon at the start of the conversation. You know, what do you now expect given the wins that we financing side and the implications of that uh, in the markets going forward? Great. Um, yeah, of course, I think we do have to be realistic with regard to the direction of travel on overall interest rate environment. Um, I think that right now we can see the the potential for uh, mobilizing, as you highlighted, blended finance for more impact oriented um, projects will be very important. Um, and I would say blended finance in a in a maybe a bit of a broader term than what is maybe used in a in a classic definition, because of course we have here in India, we may have some financing that can come from um, international, uh, um, uh, you know, bilateral agreements, as uh, as Sandhiji mentioned. But at the same time, we can utilize also the government's own um, financing and investment that's that's being um, highlighted or or emphasized towards, um, for instance, subnational financing and city infrastructure. So um, going at this in a smart way that identifies how to. Um, de-risk projects um, rather than just focusing only on pricing, I think is what IFC's experience globally in using blended finance is very, um, very critical. So understanding very clearly what is the risk in a project? Is it the offtake? Is it the technology? And focusing one's uh, blended finance or concessionality on the risk that uh, that is there rather than um you know kind of just a broad you know a discount on price um we've found is a way to actually open markets and and lead to um, more commercial financing being crowded in so i think the uh, the example of solar uh solar pv um generation in india is a fantastic example um ifc was one of the first in that space and it was you know small and somewhat risky con considered you know 15 years ago but now um now it's it's very um you know very quick uh, financing for all the projects and and you can see you know mainstream commercial finance going into that space so i think what what we need to do is take the type of work that we're doing in commercial financing and try to expand the the the, the line and expand the impact of that financing i can take an example of affordable housing. So IFC has done about $1.7 billion in affordable housing investment um, since around 2010. Um, but, you know, the affordable housing that we would do this year or next year is so different than what we would have done 10 years ago, because we are trying to deepen that point. We're making sure every affordable investment we do through financial institutions is focused on green affordable housing and ensuring that the type of products the financial institution is providing meet the needs of Indians, like using self build for instance, that's how most Indians build their homes. So this is the type of thing that we have to every single day try to move the needle a little bit further. And if we have a clear objective around what we're trying to achieve on those objectives, and that's why uh, global SDG goals and, and uh, you know, the, own, the government's own uh, objectives are very, very clear. So this is how we get there. It's, it's, a, it's an incremental step, but in the, in the impact overall can be, can be quite significant. You know, thanks, Wendy, for, for giving us two very good examples of uh, how uh, markets have worked and how IFC has been able to move forward here in India. But, you know, you talked at the start about being able to double down on your commitment to India. Uh, you gave us examples of what you've been able to do on the solar side, the affordable housing side. What are the areas of interest and opportunity as you look for, look ahead? Yeah, thanks, Shireen. So I think um, obviously the broadly speaking climate will be our defining uh, uh, strategic uh, target in the coming years. But that really will mean that it is across the board. It, climate has to be, I think, India's um, you know defining achievement uh, going forward. And the climate crisis, you know, will be won or lost in probably India's cities, actually, right? So we are looking at how do 
we make sure that all of our investments um, in manufacturing in services are aiming to um, extend to second, ter third tier, fourth, fifth, sixth tier cities, those services, but also every building we, we help finance would be green buildings. And we are looking also at how do we mobilize more private capital, whether it be domestic or international towards urban infrastructure, um, things like we've done um, like some of the first hybrid uh, annuity models in uh, wastewater and sewage treatment in um, uh, Uttarakhand, in UP. We now want to see that those sorts of models that we can uh, apply in many cities across India. So it's really build off of the experience, but go at scale um, in, in the kind of investment needed for both inclusion and climate. Yeah, uh, uh, and that's uh, again an important point that you uh, make there. Let me get... Uh... Sandeep uh, into the conversation as well and to take off from where uh, Wendy left us. Uh, uh, you know, fiscal space at this point in time uh, is constrained and that is the challenge that governments across the world uh, are faced with and hence the need to be able to look at uh, crowding in private capital. Uh, you know, this is going to be a fine balancing uh, act, uh, Sandeep. Uh, and I want to understand from you, uh, give, you talked about the partnerships with Europe. Europe particularly finds itself in a precarious spot at this point in time. So on the financing side, what are your concerns as well as what could be the potential opportunities and the new ways of being able to uh, crowd in capital, both domestic as well as international? Thank you. Um, you know, we have been talking of uh, of headwinds, but I think uh, I am a trained optimist. So I would also like to bring into the conversation some tailwinds which are uh, in favor of India. And and I think uh, what Wendy is, is is mentioning is very very encouraging. But I I believe that uh, the signaling we are getting from uh, Europe is that uh, despite the conflict in in Europe, the, the the commitments to climate and energy transition remain. And I think that is encouraging, but of course it has an uh, impact on, on, on the financing rate. I was uh, uh, just told that, you know, the Euro loans, which were almost uh, at 0 0.5 have uh, now increased to 2.77 or even 3% uh, Euro, Euro, Euro plus uh, 1 or 1 1.5. So the, the, the financing is, 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 is becoming costly, but on the other hand, uh, the Euro is depreciating. So getting money from, from Europe is actually reasonably cheaper than, than from other sources. So I find that commitment is, is not wavering uh, from the European uh, financial institutions. There is, uh, uh, there is great commitment because I think there is also a realization that for the world to achieve its uh, climate goals, India has to achieve its climate goals. That linkage is, is very, very, uh, very clear. And, and I think uh, we also need to, to be very sure that the financing commitments that have been made are, uh, are uh, utilized, are, are are uh, put on the ground and also there is a capacity issue in india we need to be able to take the money that has been promised to us and and uh, go in for green projects i think uh, some of these uh, new ideas that are coming up uh, wendy and you also mentioned blended finance i in my um, dreams never imagined that as a diplomat i will work on blended finance but you know at the prodding of uh, my colleagues from from uk and other countries uh, we have in the external affairs ministry set up a fund uh, called uh, Global Innovation Partnership Fund, which will uh, work on um, SDG and climate friendly uh, startups which are in India and take them to third countries, uh, most notably in Africa and in, in the and in the Indo Pacific. So uh, that fund is now uh, being being created. It will be an alternative investment fund listed with SEBI. Uh, we have hired a consultant who is a legal advisor. We have an MO with SBI venture capital. So a uh, kind of stuff that, uh, you know, we are doing in blended finance is absolutely mind boggling. Uh, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of uh, uh, Industry, uh, DPIIT, then MSME, they have these funds which have actually been multiplied several times. You know, the you know small fund is now becoming huge. And I think that's the whole idea. Uh, small government intervention then uh, crowds in uh, private investment. And uh, my fund is a small fund. Uh, it's about hundred million dollars, but uh, uh, already some of some friends, including uh, Vineet, uh, uh, are uh, telling me that you, we can make it five times. So uh, that is the hope, you know. So these innovative modeling uh, models of financing were uh, not heard in government circles before, but now everybody is talking about them. I think these are the tailwinds, you know. They they are pushing uh, people to change. They are pushing change across India. 
uh, they are inviting uh, we have a very friendly and inviting ecosystem so foreign partners are coming in and yesterday i was speaking to my counterpart in germany and they said you know uh, despite what is happening in europe uh, we want to work with india in their top of the list and uh, and the, the challenge would be that as uh, vikas was saying that you know the biggest crowding out the small the 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 challenge would be to to look out for the small and and give them the helping hand because the jobs and and social stability will only come from there and i think in that the msmes and the startups have a, have a big role and not every startup becomes a unicorn and whatever con uh, you may mention but you know those who are 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 not able to do that those who are not able to generate so much money in the markets you know i think uh, we need to look out for them and support them and i think there is uh, there is uh, there is that realization and there are funds available uh bharti sitare fund is for instance of the msme is one such fund which is i think huge capitalization now and they are supporting so i must um, uh, end by saying that you know climate is very much on the agenda and our partners are unwavering in in the support for climate in the in india uh, we are committed to energy transition uh, we have to uh, move away from from dirty fuels to or from fossil fuels to non fossil fuels sometimes there is a difference in understanding of our our challenges but i think on one page that we are all coinciding is hydrogen uh, we have the hydrogen mission and we are partnering with several uh, countries in 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 uh, in setting up green hydrogen in, in green ammonia exporting green hydrogen green ammonia and i think uh, hydrogen will be the talk of the town in the in the, in the coming years and maybe till 2021 nobody spoke about hydrogen you know we 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 hardly knew what it is and now uh, you know it has many colors uh, well certainly green hydrogen is the color of the season at this point in time i think that is clearly the talk of town and uh, and the government has put out the first installment of the green hydrogen policy and as you say that this is going to be a big focus area uh, and many private companies large conglomerates are looking at this as an area of opportunity where india can take the lead but i just wanted to get a quick clarification from you this uh, aif that you spoke of the corpus is 100 million to start with and when will it be operational yeah we have just today i think we have announced the early market uh, uh, engagement for that fund and uh, it is now going through the through the legal and and uh, and compliance issues it should be operational early next year early next year all right yeah. zavit so let me uh, address the issue of what the private sector can do uh, by way of either collaborating with stakeholders within this ecosystem whether it's impact investors or impact entrepreneurs or the startup ecosystem uh, of course in india we have a mandatory 2% corporate social responsibility clause so that forces companies to put away a uh, certain part of their profit towards csr spending every year uh, but you know take me through what the experience is like in bangladesh and and And, uh, uh, and what kind of innovations uh, you are looking at as a company within the private sector to be able to engage and collaborate and partner with constituents of this ecosystem mm. no uh, i think a very interesting and i'll pick up two words uh, if you look at this ecosystem uh, and in terms of really growing and changing the whole uh, economy from competing you need to move into something called collaborating because that's where we will see this grow and so and let me give a perspective as well uh, in the whole bangladesh history the ready made garments which is the second largest contributor they were all msmes by the way when they started in the 80s none of them were big global uh, companies now they are of course but how they did was they actually collaborated to create this whole ecosystem of building capability and development so if you look at the biggest thing for a country like ours is how do you really create an ecosystem to develop this capability and and if you look at uh, the biggest thing around these things are also the fdis that came in to help us grow and fdi movement actually happens from two perspective one is an efficiency fdi the other is market fdi efficiency is essentially because you are the cheapest producer you produce and you export and that's what we had but if i look at the future for bangladesh it will not be only efficiency but it will also be market because there's a large amount of consumption economy that can uh, exist in this country now and uh, there is a segment of the population which is actually as wealthy as australia collectively so you will suddenly realize that the opportunity is now in order to really get into and and get tapping out the max of it you need to start collaborating and working with it for instance one of the biggest uh, challenges as a country we uh, face is environment mm -hmm. and the whole thing around the, how do you really manage waste in this country now this country uh, if you look at 
consumption waste, it's uh, probably less than 5% to an average uh, individual in the US. But the rate of growth is phenomenally high. So by the time in 2030, when we'll become the ninth largest consumer market, this will become a potential problem. So you need to start working on it. How do you start working today? And what we are trying to do is essentially create an ecosystem with partners where you're able to really collect waste. And the intention today is as Unilever, our plan is uh, by next year, we collect 100% of the plastic that goes to the environment. We collect back. In fact, today we are creating an ecosystem of collecting 40%. Now, if you ask me, my ecosystem is not designed to address that. And this is where collaboration starts where organizations actually are partnering with us. Uh, and, and this is where I come of this whole, uh, what Sandeep Ji just talked about, our startups and ecosystem. My take on all of these are they have to be businesses. Uh, we call it in a fancy name of startups, and I know there's a whole valuation game, but they need to create value for the uh, country. In fact, when you create value for the country, your valuation will ultimately go up. And I think that's where complementary uh, happens, uh, complementary work happens. We've actually collaborated with people, uh, unlike in India, where there is actually quite a wide ecosystem and uh, collection. But what we needed to do is formalize many of them. So we have actually started to work with many of these organizations where they have been a great partner. Uh, and they also learn from us, we learn from them. And the moment we collaborate, we realize that you're able to create the whole ecosystem. Or for that matter, let's say renewable energy. For instance, there's an organization uh, that we partner with that helps us to really step up and take up renewable energy within our ecosystem, because that's exactly where we need to move into. Uh, as Sandeep, we talked about from fossil fuel, we'll need to get into renewable energy, whichever we end up going into, because the future is always like that. But this whole solution today economically may not exist. But the best way to do it is uh, actually how do you collaborate with partners? And when we, and we've seen when you collaborate with partners, you're able to solve the problem because as businesses, we can identify problems. For instance, the, another uh, opportunity is around financial inclusion. Now, if you look at how our financial inclusion is set up, typically it is set up uh, to finance large amount of loans and credit. But when I'm going to go and give it to a small retailer, he requires a very small amount of credit. It's actually insignificant. I cannot have the same check and balance and the same risk profiling that I do for a large investment. So that requires a complete rewiring of our system. And, and I can tell you, we've been collaborating. We've failed as well, where we've gone back to the drawing board. And this is not an easy one to do because what typically will happen because we start with our, our, our sort of established know-how and knowledge and then we obviously trip and fall, but what we really know that there's a huge opportunity. So for me, the way I look at it is that in, in order to really see the next 50 years of this country, I personally believe many of these organizations uh, will actually play a pivotal role in complementing many of the work that we are doing as a country or as an organization. Yeah, and you know, valid point that you make there in terms of highlighting uh, the progress that Bangladesh has been able to make, especially in the textile space, in the garment space, particularly, and invite FDI. I mean, every large uh, a foreign player in the garment market is operating in Bangladesh. And uh, that clearly has been a multiplier, both in terms of uh, job creation, as well as being able to draw in uh, foreign direct investment. And the point on collaborating with uh, uh, companies uh, in the base space, in uh, the space of trying to create circular economy and take that forward. And I know many large conglomerates who don't have the in-house capabilities are trying to nurture these partnerships and take those partnerships forward. But Wendy, let me come back to you uh, and talk about uh, not just from an India perspective, but globally as well, uh, the kind of impact that we are seeing on account of the funds that are coming through, the ESG funds that are putting in large amounts of financing, of access to capital in the hands of impact entrepreneurs and impact, uh, you know, uh, startups, uh, in not just in markets like India, but globally as well. Do you believe that that trend that we've seen accelerate, especially in the past two to three years through the course of the pandemic is likely to continue? Yeah, thanks, Jane. Absolutely. I think um, the trend towards ESG and, and green investing is is probably one of the defining characteristics of even the global global capital flows going forward, uh, quite honestly. Um, I mean, from the point of IFC, we've been trying to help make sure that we set standards um, for um, things like green bonds and particularly looking at, um, you know, again, uh, shifting the, the barrier a little bit further to sustainability linked bonds. So that includes not only 
investment in, in kind of green and climate related, but also in looking at uh, aspects of inclusion, quality work, um, and, and diversity in, in one's operations. So I think that, you know, a holistic view, and I think that uh, a holistic view of what a, a corporation can do to improve the, the lives of their employees and their communities um, is really uh, where we see the capital flowing into the future. Um, and including that is uh, another kind of capital instrument that, that um, IFC is also backed in East Asia, and we'd like to do some here in, in South Asia, is also uh, blue bonds, which is related to uh, Javed Bai's point around um, circularity and ensuring that plastics and uh, the plastic kind of ecosystem is actually being reused. We're looking at um, how does that impact kind of marine uh, pollution. Um, and this actually is one of the things that is very challenging from a corporate point of view. And I'm sure that, and then we have had, IFC has also had some challenges in being able to invest at scale in this place, in this space. But, you know, we see that blue bonds are, are another um, growth, uh, growth area. And I don't think that, that that is going to reverse. I don't think there's a choice, another choice here. Um, we really have to see that all of the infrastructure, the, the new products, whether it be a financial institution or consumer products, have to um, address both the climate impact on kind of you know, mitigation and energy efficiency and things like that. But also we've seen um, you know, quite clear pro pro problems with things like flooding, fires, et cetera, right here, you know, in South Asia. And so we need to make sure that our, our buildings and our infrastructure are, are created in a way that's resilient for the, for the future challenges to come. And this capital will flow specifically towards that. And so I think across the board, whether it be infrastructure or, um, you know, large logistics plays, now we see that most of them are putting a, a separate entity that they're going to ensure is 100% green so that ESG fl funds flow to that green entity. And I imagine that it's just like other, other instances that that green entity will continue to grow. Maybe the older uh, brownfield entity will continue to, to shrink and, uh, and it will soon all be green. And it must be. There's no, there's no real other choice uh, for the world. Uh, let's hope that we do the world green and blue. Uh, and certainly is the hope, the aspiration of point in time. And, uh, you know, just uh, looking at some of the numbers, which are India specific, uh, and I'd done a show a couple of weeks ago on uh, the impact funding in India. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, about 300 impact enterprises raised about $7 billion in 2021. Uh, 62 women founded impact enterprises raised about a billion and a half. Uh, and the funding was mobilized by in impact enterprises uh, in 2021, went up 100 35 percent so uh, so that's that's good news there and we're hoping this will uh, just uh, accelerate but uh, uh, you know continue to deepen as well and and more impact uh, entrepreneurs will get a slice of uh, this pie that that we hope will expand but uh, Sandeep let me come back to you now uh, on some of the concerns that have been raised especially when it comes to the uh, access to finance uh, not just uh, the domestic capital, but the uh, international capital that's coming in, some concerns around the FCRA clearances or the lack of them, uh, you know, are, are those wrinkles that are being ironed out? Well, uh, to answer your specific question, you see, um, we have international commitments, you know, we have to uh, comply with the FATF regulations and also, you know, but there are strict uh, compliance norms with regard to uh, to uh, money laundering. So I think a, a cleanup exercise was conducted and, uh, uh, you know, the FCRA rules were changed. And, you know, I think we try to infuse more transparency. Now, when you want to be transparent, there are some people who want to remain in the dark. So uh, it created issues. I think uh, we, we, have, we are in discussions with organizations and, and uh, we are finding way out. And I think it's, it's a pro pro process of change that is happening. You know, we, people were used to a particular way of working and, uh, and processes uh, have changed and uh, people are just getting used to the new normal. But my personal view is that, you know, it is all for the good, for more transparency in the system, for, for, uh, to prevent uh, misuse of monies which come from abroad. And I think uh, that objective is, is important from the national security uh, perspective. I would also like to extend uh, uh, what I was saying by, by, by mentioning that, you know, in this transition of India, uh, there is a huge, uh, particularly in the green transition, 
there's a huge role for international partnerships and i think uh, wendy in a way epitomizes that and and, and also uh, you know uh, um, javed is, is an example of where we need to partner with with countries uh, in, in south asia but uh, you know some of these uh, initiatives that india took in the last few years i'll mention one of that which is the international solar alliance now uh, you know 5 7 years back uh, everybody talked solar but you know solar panels were not available technology was not available it was very risky uh, to invest in solar projects and uh, and today it's a very different story and and some of the credit goes to india for for taking it up at the at the international level and today the isa is a, uh, as an international organization is very successful the first international organization with a, its secretariat in india and i think this is something all indian should be proud of and again another example uh, Javed was mentioning about uh, plastics. Uh, you know, we have banned uh, single-use plastics from July of this year, and we have gone ahead and we have signed an, uh, or we are about to sign an MOU with France that uh, we will work on internationally enforceable single-use plastic ban across the world, and we are partnering with Spain, uh, with France on that. So this is again, you know, an example of something uh, uh, which we felt in India was good. and then we felt that it was good for the world and we are partnering with several countries in enforcing a single use plastic ban in, in the world so i would uh, reiterate that you know there is great role for international partnerships if there is good and also in esg you see uh, the problem with financing is that sometimes this green finance is not cheaper than than commercial finance so you know you wa- you want us to go green but then your interest rates are high if green financing is available uh, at at uh, a few hundred basis point less than commercial borrowing you will find lot of enterprises in india going green taking money and 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 you know uh, sequestering carbon or uh, reducing carbon emission and you know but but i i know that it's not easy to get green money uh, although uh, the there are very strict conditions and you know i think uh, something tailor made for indian conditions needs to come up and there should be uh, india specific green funds uh, which which uh, our companies should be able to access Well, India specific green funds is the ask there from Sandeep, but uh, you know very interesting uh, uh, aspect that you raise that India uh, intends to take the lead in terms of ensuring that we see a single use plastic ban across the world. And you gave us example of the negotiations, the conversations that are on with France at forward. So let me just use this opportunity to ask you. Uh, about how we intend to use the G20 presidency and that platform uh, as India takes the G20 presidency next year to be able to take some of these uh, targets, some of these goals that we've just talked about forward. What could be the big ideas uh, that we take the lead on uh, as we take on the G20 presidency? I think uh, uh, the G20 presidency will, uh, uh, when India takes over later this year, will focus on some of these issues very much. You know, and uh, one one of our uh, objectives would be to to have a have a more uh, sustained uh, discussion on on what Prime Minister called life, that lifestyle for uh, for the environment. You know that we cannot afford to have such. A, uh high consuming kind of lifestyle which is so degrading for the environment and expect that the environmental challenges will be sorted out it's not possible so you know we need to need to work on a lifestyle we need to conserve more we need to spend less on ourselves and and take care of of the nature so i think it will be a very inclusive agenda it will talk of digital uh, inclusion it will talk of environment it will talk of you know how uh, to partner uh, with other countries how to uh, to focus efforts for the global south so i think our uh, g20 agenda is very environment friendly and development and and, and south friendly i think that, that is what we bring to the table and if you see the uh, the invited list uh, bangladesh has been invited to, to the to the summit and and many other developing countries so i think uh, our our focus and our uh, objectives are, are very clear from the from the beginning right uh, javed uh, you know one of the challenges that uh, i know uh, large corporations like unilever are faced with uh, is that there is a lack of harmonization or uniformity uh, of standards of esg metrics of esg norms uh, and i know that there is an effort to move towards that uh, we have of course now got benchmarks in place whether it's what the world economic forum has put together in association with uh, the big four uh, and other such metrics uh 
Are we moving now to a more harmonized, easier to do business world when we talk about uh, ESG goals? Uh, that's a very interesting question. And incidentally, uh, one of the government arm, Access to Information, which is part of the Prime Minister's office, actually reached out to Unilever Bangladesh asking that can we help them put together an ESG framework? And as you rightly said, I think now there is a framework because when you started the journey um, a couple of decades back, we were designing as you went. But I now believe that globally, the business case for ESG is very clear. Uh, I don't think there's any debate about it. And I think the point being the right kind of framework and what will happen is once we have a framework, different people will be in different spaces of this journey because some of us will be beginning of the journey. Some might be a bit more advanced and mature on it. But I personally believe that uh, creating a framework will actually uh, help guide the business community. And this is something that uh, I'm also part of the Foreign Investors Chamber and Industries in, in Bangladesh as well. And one of the uh, thing I lead is sustainability agenda as well. And that's also part of this. So we will actually get the industry to start and then collaborate with the local chambers to really create a framework. And, and once you create, you also realize that based on the country needs and requirements, some of these things you need to dial up a bit more environment and climate being a critical one for Bangladesh, because for the 2041 vision that we have got in the country, that will be a critical enabler. So personally, I think uh, we don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel. There's enough resources available. And in fact, uh, what Sandeep Ji has talked about, many of the uh, initiatives that we have done in Bangladesh has been picked up from the work on plastic that was done by CII and uh, FIKI India as well because they collectively, they've actually done a lot of work. A lot of work has been triggered by our operation in India as well. And, and I think the question is, how do you really pick up faster and quicker? And collaboration spaces like G20 only enables us to really transmit the knowledge that we have. Mm. Because I, I personally believe over the next uh, 40, 50 years, the power of changing the agenda on climate will be more on the global south because we will be the point trigger point to change and, and take it to the new level uh, because it is onus it will be on all of us collectively to really push the needle here. Yes, uh, the onus is on collective action and uh, we're pretty much out of time on our, on our conversations. Let me end by asking each one of you, since we are talking about transformational change and transformational impact. Wendy, let me start by asking you, uh, you know, specifically for IFC uh, in this region, the, the biggest focus area to create the kind of transformational change and transformational impact uh, that we aspire for. So I think for us, um, marrying the climate agenda in you know, the details of what we do and what we finance and the partners we work with, with the need that this is an inclusive agenda, that this transition is fully inclusive of MSMEs, they have the technology, they have the finance, um, they have the uh, access to markets in order to fully participate in that. And a final point that I just wanted to highlight that I think is, is extraordinarily important particularly for India, but I mean, it's a global issue, is also on the inclusion agenda. We need to make sure that, you know, for instance, uh, women fully are included in, in this transition as well. And, and you know, labor force participation in India by women has, has fallen under 20%. And this is a real challenge. So there's an opportunity that both the small, medium enterprises and women can be really integrated into this transition. Um, but for us, it's all about that integration and inclusion towards uh, the, the greener future that we mentioned before. Well, thank you very much for highlighting the need for more gender balanced uh, uh, recovery, not just for India, but for the world as well, but particularly for India, where we have seen, as you point out, a drop in uh, the women's uh, participation in the labor force. And I, I hope we, we reverse that. Uh, uh, but uh, Sandeep, uh, you know, let me let me give you uh, closing comments as well. Uh, you know, the, the single biggest area of focus uh, to create transformational change and impact. Yeah, you see, when I became a diplomat, um, I was told that uh, the objective of foreign policy is to leverage our foreign relations for transforming India. But I think, uh, you know, what we are all now looking at is also, you know, leveraging uh, the changes and the transformation that has happened in India uh, for making impact in, uh, globally. I think that is an agenda which has come up very strongly. And in and, and that, we will partner with the Global South and, you know, take the India story, some of the successes that we have had and take it abroad uh, and 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 there are many many but my 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 focus would be on the digital uh, story that india 
has and i think that that has many many takers around the world and we should be able to take that abroad yes that certainly is uh, uh, an area of opportunity for india to take the digital story whether it's upi or uh, other instruments that have been created and take that uh, uh, to the world and that certainly is something that is being spoken of uh, zaved the the final say to you okay so uh, i'll i'll tell you what i believe i should be doing for unilever and as a result the country first is a uh, waste free world how do we really create a waste free bangladesh second is how do you really move to renewable energy a substantial chunk of my operation has to move to renewable energy and the third one is for the bangladesh of the next 50 years we need to create capability of our youth to a new level so one of the role that we will play is how do you upskill a million youth to a different level of capability so that we are able to compete globally those are the three things i would believe if i have achieved at the end of my tenure i would be happy about and saying i have done something small for the country well uh, zavid we wish you the very best of luck uh, and we hope that you do manage to get uh, all those three done uh, bendy and sandeep thank you very much for joining us here uh, on this plenary session on the opening session to uh, uh, to really set the context of where things currently stand and more importantly what the road ahead looks like i hope that uh, at sankalp at this forum we are going to see many more conversations uh, uh between investors government policy makers uh and of course entrepreneurs because uh, you know uh, very often as we have seen whether it's education or healthcare or in fact climate and agriculture the market necessarily doesn't always deliver the goods and we hope to be able to find solutions uh, at the intersection uh, of of the same but we do hope that there will be uh, conversations that will uh, will lead to meaningful solutions not just for india but for the world uh, so thank you very much for this opportunity and it's great to be back here uh, and i wish you very best for the next 3 days shraddha it's back to you thank you so much shireen for stirring such an incredible conversation this morning thank you wendy sandeep and zaved it has been an honor to host all of you at sankalp this year we hope that you enjoy the rest of the summit please make your sankalp experience amazing by filling out your personal information in boha and networking you can join all of the sessions by going into the schedule and looking at the information for each session the speakers and information on how to join please make sure you take a moment to visit our partners and exhibitors in the exhibit area to learn more about the incredible work that you're doing that they are doing we look forward to you having an amazing experience at sankalp and we hope to host you in person next year thank you again and we hope you enjoy sankalp thank you thank you thank you, thank you.